Hello, David. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, I think we need more time since the participants, I think uh, most of the students uh, still having class right now. Okay. So we need more time to wait for them to join this meeting. No, no, we can, we can start at nine. Huh? I mean, we can start at 3 p.m. for you. No? Yes, yes, okay. okay. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm still with you. I just called you before in order to check. It's okay. okay, okay, okay. Oh, I, I'm working, I'm working for you. No. Okay. No stress with that. Okay, see you, see you soon.
Selamat datang kepada para partisipan. Eh, kita menunggu sebentar lagi ya untuk beberapa mahasiswa yang akan bergabung di sini karena sebelumnya ada kelas jadi sedikit agak terlambat dan kita masih menunggu karena di sini pendaftar ada kurang lebih 150 mahasiswa namun baru masuk 35 mahasiswa jadi kita menunggu untuk beberapa waktu. David, are you here? Baik, sambil menunggu peserta yang lain untuk join di meeting ini ya, perlu saya sampaikan lebih dahulu bahwa webinar pada hari ini adalah merupakan salah satu rangkaian dari webinar series yang dilaksanakan oleh Departemen Teknik Geologi Fakultas Teknik Universitas Diponegoro yang merupakan bagian dari program visiting profesor yang mana hari ini kita akan bersama Dr. David Menir yang beliau sudah mengisi dua seri sebelumnya di seri ke pertama dan ketiga dan hari ini adalah seri yang ketiga dari beliau kita juga akan uh, masih bersama beliau di pada tanggal 12 dan 15 Oktober nanti dengan tema stratigrafi hari ini kita masih akan melanjutkan tema sebelumnya tentang uh, geologi kelautan sehingga saya harap di sini bagi peserta yang minggu lalu mengikuti webinar ini dan masih menyimpan pertanyaan yang kemarin karena waktunya terbatas ya bisa menyampaikan pertanyaannya pada hari ini kemudian sebagai informasi juga nanti malam kami masih akan menyelenggarakan webinar series nomor 5 oleh Profesor Magali Coach dengan tema remote sensing bagi peserta pemetaan yang akan pemetaan tahun ini diwajibkan untuk mengikuti webinar nanti malam Kemudian juga webinar-webinar ini kami siarkan langsung streaming on, on, uh, online 
live di YouTube kami di Geologi Undip Channel. Jadi silakan bagi mungkin teman-teman atau uh, kerabatnya yang belum mendaftar dan uh, tidak bisa masuk karena kuota nanti mungkin penuh bisa streaming langsung di channel Geologi Undip. Kemudian untuk info-info webinar ini nanti Anda bisa ikuti juga di uh, sosial media kami di Instagram geologi underscore undip atau juga di web seperti yang tertera pada uh, pamflet yang saya tampilkan di layar. Oke, okay, David, hello David. Are you here? Sebelumnya kami menyampaikan permohonan maaf karena kemarin kami memberikan link yang uh, diperbaharui ya. Jadi hari ini ini adalah link yang baru. Mungkin beberapa dari para partisipan sempat masuk di link yang berbeda. Namun ini adalah link yang benar dan sudah uh, kami koreksi via email. Mohon maaf atas ketidaknyamanannya sehingga mungkin uh, Dr. David Tadi masih menunggu sampai jam setengah dua, baru beberapa yang masuk. Sehingga mungkin kita akan memulai beberapa menit sebelum jam dua. Mohon maaf atas ketidaknyamanannya sekali lagi. David, are you here? I'm here, okay. yeah. Okay, we already have more than 50 students here, so I think we can start now. Ah, okay, alors let me change my view because I, I see the sun at the back of me. Uh, yes. Ah, I don't okay. Know if, it's, if it's good for you, I don't know. Uh, it's so dark. I think it's backlight. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, alors let's see. I will change the place. Much yes. Can I take Much better for the Oh, that's... Uh, Because today I, I am at home. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can see your house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's better. Thinking now, you know, I'm just I want to take my uh, tablet. Okay. So, uh, just for my information, I mean, uh, yes, is it is it mostly the same public following all the class or not? Excuse me. I mean, is it same the same students? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, That's yes. why. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Mm. Okay. Um, Are you good? I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. 
So I want to start with a, a case studies that I um, I have prepared. I will yeah. hope so that you have the PowerPoint. Okay, I'll, I will stop sharing my screen then. Okay, okay, I will do it. One minute. Cool. We already have more than 50 students here right now. Okay. I, I can see uh, eight zero. Hmm? So you, you, you have a success with that, huh? you have many students. Yes. yes. Okay, did, did, you, did you receive this PowerPoint, Anis, uh, this one? This PowerPoint? Yeah, because last, I, I, last, uh, last Monday, I think. Yeah, maybe, yes. So, yeah. okay. Then um, uh, I have three there. So by today, I think that we will do two or three. I would like okay. to share with the students a case study. And uh, um, by today as well, I will send to you some link with uh, bibliography and some book. Okay. Okay, uh, okay. To give that to the students and to have a PDF book uh, yeah, okay. following to, to continue to, to work by themselves. Uh, okay, so okay. I, let me know when I can start. Okay, okay, then I will open the meeting right now. Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for David. I am happy to see you again here in the fourth series of webinar. This webinar is part of the visiting professor program organized by the Department of Geological Engineering, Universitas Diponegoro. Uh, previously, we already have Dr. David Menier here with us and we will have him again today and we will have him again more in a few weeks. And we will... Uh, Previously, we have topic about the marine and coastal geoscience, and we will have the same topic as previously. And as information, Dr. David Menier is an associate professor from Université Britain Sud de France. His main research topic is uh, focused on geomorphology and sedimentology, as well as tectonics and climate, especially in a coastal area in controlling the stratigraphy of a basin. In the last meeting, we have learned about plastic coast and shoreline processes, including the fair weather, storm and tide processes and their effect on changing the shoreline morphology. And today we will have, uh, I think we will have the coastal strati stratigraphic stratigraphy sequences, I think. And maybe we will uh, hear about some case study from David's research uh, as an example for the theory. And, but before we start, I think I need to remind you again that uh, to turn off your speaker and your webcam during the presentation. So we won't interrupt David. And for you who have questions, you can write your questions in the chat box or you can ask directly to David by raising your hand. So I think I've already wasted too much time here. So I'll give David time to start presentation. Are you ready, David? Yes, I'm ready. I just, um, could you see my PowerPoint? Yes, yes, we can see okay. you. Okay. You have 90 minutes as usual, David. Okay, uh, but you, you mm -hmm. I have a, a small issue with my uh, Michele is not working. My, uh, um, I don't know why. Okay, that. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Uh, I'll try to do by another way. I think it's not working very well. I don't know why. Your your pointer or. You. Yeah, the pointer is not working, then I will not use it, maybe. 
Ah, okay. Um, okay. I don't understand why it's like that. But I can see your pointer here in the screen. Yeah, but uh, he's moving, uh -huh. but I, I, I cannot see him. Uh -huh. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I don't know why it's like that. No, oh, never mind. Uh, we don't use it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, <laughs> following what we uh, have discussed uh, last two days, or I would like to share with you uh, one case studies. So, could you hear me very well? Yes, David. We can hear you okay. very well. So, uh, this is one uh, subject that I want to share. Following what we were talking. Um, about you know uh, the transportations of sediment from onshore to uh, the coast, uh, and to talk about the regional sedimentary uh, budget uh, that we have to um, continue everywhere around the world to understand this is uh, one thing that uh, we have to develop. Uh, even we are talking about sand or mud, it's very complex sometimes to understand what could be the origin of the sediment and uh, why is uh, going on the left, on the right, everywhere. So we were talking um, and we were uh, discussing with my colleagues about uh, these topics and I'm still very uh, motivated to develop and to continue to work on the relationships between the budget, uh, sediment budget that we have onshore, and to try to understand what are the contouring factors allowing to the sand to go around the coast or maybe to go offshore as well. So I will give to uh, Hanis and Najib and Thomas uh, the PDF that I made with a few colleagues, and I have invited as well Franto Novico from Indonesia, and later on we will do the same type of. Um, uh, publications uh, using some example with you in Indonesia with Najib. So in our case, so we are, uh, oops, okay. So you can see my pointer now, I can see the, okay. We are, it's an example from certain part of Brittany. So this is the map. And um, I made this figure showing that in this case, we are from, Gav uh, Cap to Bay of Kibor uh, area where we have a small uh, isthmus over there. We have a very wide uh, sandy beaches uh, with uh, dune. And the questions that we would like to understand or to explain if you see the um, distributions of the sediment along this coast from Gav Cap to Kibron. The, the width is totally different here. It's very brittle. You can see that the sandy beaches is very uh, uh, narrow. And uh, over there, we can observe more and more sediment. And again, we have a place that where the, the zone is very brittle. And in this case, I don't know if you remember, but I show you one photo uh, showing Gavre Peninsula. And we have a lot of people living there. And we have a lot of people living as well in Kibro Peninsula. Mean the local government have to take care about that and to try to uh, protect this area because we have a road, we have uh, as well the possibility we use sometime during the summertime train, so to, to permit the access to the peninsula. So you, you can feel or you can understand all the questions that we have about the vulnerability and the sens sensibility of uh, the area. Anyway, uh, I, we had as well uh, in this case, in the offshore part, uh, the type of uh, um, seafloor that we can met from the coast to the offshore zone. And in this case, uh, you can observe that we have a bay with, uh, in this area, with maybe uh, with different type of sediment. So the seafloor is, 
dominated by sand, mud, uh, and um, gravel. But you can observe as well that we have here, here, an indoor shore zone, some shoals, uh, Tulven shores, Birverde shores. So it's a rocky seafloor. And uh, so the full zone is not covered by sediment. So it's different than what we can observe maybe uh, in Java Sea, for example. So when we are talking about sedimentary budget, uh, the question is, if I have sun here, why I have sun and why the sun and the quartz particles, uh, where they come from, uh, why is more thicker in this in this zone? Why is very brittle in this case? So to do that, we have to use different type of uh, uh, tools. So we we are using different tools that you can uh, observe over there. We have some uh, you know ADCP uh, offshore uh, in order to measure. Uh, the velocity in the water column, uh, the tidal currents and the wave processes. We were using some, uh, uh, what do you call that, um, Boyd, I think, uh, from uh, French uh, Marine Institute, Ifromer, uh, allowing to have some uh, monitoring, uh, acquisitions of uh, uh, of hydrodynamic, hydrodynamics uh, conditions. And we have as well some information about the seabed. We were doing some, uh, you know, collecting of sand or mud from the coast toward 30 meter depths in order to see if we have or not a link from this area to, to, to the coast. And of course, we were uh, using all the old bibliography explaining uh, that uh, from Gaff Peninsula to Etel Rivers, we have a long shore grief uh, already described, but not really uh, well understood. So again and again, uh, we have to continue to try to estimate the volume of uh, sediment can uh, move uh, from a point A to a point B, how many time, which type of velocity we, we have to, um, to, to, to do for that. So we need a lot of uh, many, many, many tools in order to, to constrain a maximum of information in order to have the better understanding about the controlling factors in this uh, uh, case. Okay, so we, you have to collect the wind data distributions uh, and as well to, this, to collect the wave data, uh, wind data and the wave data distributions. Uh, and the, the questions uh, was to use uh, questions uh, established by uh, uh, a guy from USA. Uh, the questions from uh, Alair Meyer. So, you tell me you will tell me as well if you want uh, these publications i can give uh, you or maybe you can find it uh, online anyway uh Haller Meyer was an engineer a coastal engineer uh, uh, interested about the, the the depths where the probable sedimentary particles can come from in order to uh, go to um, to, to the shore, shore face uh, or to the foreshore and maybe reach the, the back shore as well. So this is the equation that is using that we call that DOC1 uh, with some uh, coefficient that we have over there. And uh, HS uh, means the wave height, height that you can extract from the, the data that you can get uh, offshore or maybe from the, uh, table established by the Marine Geological Institute or your uh, local government uh, in Indonesia. Uh, and you can, with this theoretical, theoretical approach, estimate the, uh, the water depth 
where the wave processes can take the sediment and move the quartz particles toward the, 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 the land, so toward the shoreline. So, um, and you can use as well another equation, and the other equation, the difference, it's only that we can add as well the type of sediment that we can uh, have, and we have a second formula uh, allowing to define with a better accuracy the physical limit of a potential transport on the seafloor considering the mean sediment grain size. So this is as well really important because uh, the velocity and the capacity of uh, the tidal currents and the wave processes uh, can uh, uh, transport during a long way and during many hours sometimes uh, sediment grain. So two equations and with these two equations uh, using as well another uh, uh, if you forget the theory, you can go and you can dive and you can collect uh, some information. So we were collecting uh, from each point that you have over there, uh, for example, from Ethel Rivers to where uh, 30 meter depth. We were collecting one, two, three, four, five uh, marine sediment samples, and I. Uh, I have asked to the diver to take photos in order to show as well which type of sediment and uh, what about the geometry at the seafloor. So over there you can observe sandbars with small ripper marks and you go uh, to a depth zone and you have uh, ripper marks with bifurcations of crest and you see over there at this depth uh, less than uh, 15 meters, you can observe uh, animals like Ophira, but you can see uh, that the seafloor, the sedimentary fascias, uh, it's more composed by mud or fine particles. And more you are going uh, in this uh, transect uh, to the deeper zone, it's more muddy. And you can observe over there another theory. So you, you can as well do a grain size analysis, uh, compare with these uh, sectors and with these transects, and uh, discuss about the distributions of both of some bars. So this is the third one on the eastern part that we made as well. So between the coast to where uh, 10 meter depths, we have ripper marks, so explaining that the, the wave processes are really active um, probably uh, every day uh, from 10 meters. So this is the view uh, from the marine geologist and using the equations from uh, Allaire Meyer and uh, we wanted to compare and to say, okay, we can have some observations. So mean you have to organize a field trip and this is marine field trip, I can say that. And uh, you can check, you can get photos, you can observe. So we need people to go outside. And in parallel, we can use uh, some modeling uh, um, tools in order to, 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 to see the, the difference or, and to say, uh, is it true? or what I'm observing, is it correct or not? So I like this type of uh, um, approach uh, to, to combine, uh, you know, uh, uh, skills from people that they like to use equations. This is not my case, for example, me, I prefer to go on the boat, collect sediment. So, so we, we don't have the same approach, but we have to share. And when we share, we, we, we can improve a lot knowledge about the distributions, the motions of the sediment of the seafloor. So it's a big challenge by today because um, when we are talking about sedimentary budget along the shoreline, it's really, really uh, important and very motivate, uh, motivated for, for the scientific uh, communities. Uh, and when I say you that we need a lot of uh, tools. Um, I, I, I got as well uh, sonar scan, scan survey 
in 2005, 2008. I, I took time to publish that uh, because I was really busy. But anyway, all the data that we can collect every day, even if 10 years back or tomorrow in the future, we need to put that in the GIS database. So this is the future and we can share. And at least later on for the new generations, we can uh, use again all the data. You know, uh, data is really important because interpretations can change, but the data is really the thing that we can uh, rethink, uh, rediscuss with colleagues and compare and compare again. So we were using uh, sonar side scan, we were using ball, uh, because to publish by today it's a lot of competitions, so, so all the editors want to see uh, nice figures, but at least to be uh, sure that you you were using the maximum of the informations in your area, trying to answer to the questions to the problem statement uh, that uh, was in this case to discuss about the uh, where was the depth of closures of my sandy beachy system. So after that. We were uh, collecting some, you know, value about the DOC one and DOC two, and uh, I will take one example. So you see the sections one over there. So uh, the DOC one is around seven meter depths. Uh, can reach in this case if you use the sedimentary facies eight meters. Anyway, approximately, we don't have. Uh, uh, the same uh, depth when you are using the two uh, equations. So you can publish both of them and quite interested as well to go back and to compare with your photography, with your sedimentary facets that you collect and to discuss about why in these sections two, uh, using the factors uh, from uh, hydrodynamics uh, um, database that we got in 2014, we have uh, minus 11 meter depths, uh, minus 19. So if you compare with 2013, it's quite, quite similar, huh? but uh, over there we have one meter. Anyway, you have some interrogation sometimes, you see over there, huh? it's very uh, different. Anyway, you need to have uh, average, and with this wrench, you can uh, discuss and go back to the reality. So uh, when I said to the reality, uh, in this offshore zone, uh, we have for you over there, so the depth of closures in the yellow line uh, without using the sedimentary facies. So we add it, so seven meter depths, 10, 11. And we have the second one the, in the red line. So when, when I was uh, in front of my figures uh, after adding these new information, firstly, my first react was to say, OK, uh, in this case, the depth of closures, and apparently, if I'm talking about DOC1 or DOC2, this is very close to the shoreline. And I have over there a rocky shore zone. When I was going to the southern part, you have a small basin over there uh, between two rocky shore and again over there. And you can see that the first DOC one is approximately following the external limit of the rocky shore. But for the red uh, line, the DOC2, this, the depth is following the external limit of most of the uh, rocky shore. So it, it's quite interesting to see that. And uh, I will not say that it's the, the most important result, but I will say that in this map, in this littoral zone from Gap to Kibron Peninsula, the active 
sedimentary prism look like controlled by the geo-heritage and fault system. So in this zone, we don't have tectonics. Uh, I will not to be confused with you. We don't have tectonics. It's very subtle, very subtle. We, we have some earthquakes, but it's not, it's not the case like in Java, uh, in Southeast Asia. It's a very quiet place. But previously, we got some you know, um, geological events, but a long time back, uh, very long time back, maybe the last uh, big events, uh, uh, occurs, uh, I would say, 30 million years back. And, and again, it was not a, a big one, act, as we can observe by today in Borneo Island. Anyway, I want to, to discuss with you this term, geo-heritage or structural heritage. And I think it's really important. If you uh, think back about Java Island, I was talking with you about the first chapter about the shape of the Java Island. And you remember that even Jakarta Bay is controlled by fault. Even Semarang Bay is controlled by fault. So anyway, uh, we have to care about the heritage, the structural heritage in order to uh, discuss about the transportations of sediment from onshore to onshore. This is one of the results that uh, we, we have probably to, to care um, in the futures in the zone where we have, of course, faults, active or not, uh, but with a step, you know, um, or maybe some rocky shore, because when you have rocky shore, uh, can explain that the energy is higher, uh, or different, and the sediment cannot be above. And I was doing a conceptual model uh, in order to explain in this case that we have to separate maybe the active sedimentary prism. So mean that uh, in my area, um, from Gare Peninsula to Kibron Peninsula, we have three sections. And the width is totally different. You see, uh, one kilometer, uh, four, six. Uh, but it's, I said, the active sedimentary prism every day. And the relic sedimentary prism uh, that we have offshore are separated in this case by, by a back shore, by a basement shore. Uh, and this shore, it's very close with the rocky zone that I was showing to you. And you have the upper and the lower limit uh, expressed by DOC1 and DOC2. So it's, it's quite, quite interesting to see the, 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 the link uh, between the geo heritage, I will say the topography at the top of the basement. Anyway, uh, in this case, sometime when you have a storm, storm event, uh, the, an extreme hydrodynamics event, you can remove, and you can sometimes maybe see some particles go and to supply uh, and to increase the sedimentary budget in the active sedimentary prism. Don't put here, uh, I mean, a, a dam uh, in your mind. No, uh, can be connected, but you need extreme events in order to allow the sediment to go to the to the coast. So. This is what uh, I would like. I wanted to to share with you in order to show a case studies in South Britain. So let me now go back to uh, the next chapter. Uh, so the next chapter should be uh, this one. Then we are talking about coastal stratigraphy sequences. Is it uh, okay, Anis? I can continue. Yes, of course, you can continue now, David. Okay, thank you so much. So, coastal stratigraphy sequences. Oh, so, you know uh, better than me or like me that uh, geologists or biologists or ecologists uh, want to understand uh, uh, why uh, we have this biodiversity, why uh, this coast is like that. Uh, uh, and uh, what about the climate, etc. And mostly we need to use this law of uni uniformitarism 
formulated by James Hutton, the present is the key to the past. Uh, so most of the uh, geologists today agree that present processes and force are very similar to those that operated throughout geological, geologic time. Um, so we, we need people uh, with the capability to find in the archive of uh, the geological uh, events some indicators about uh, what was the past in order to understand the present and what could be the futures. Uh, sometimes it's not really the same because we don't have the same organism or the climate was different. But anyway, we are we need geologists uh, in order to, to advise and uh, to work as well with what I said two, two, two weeks back with uh, multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, it's really important to discuss with your colleagues from the biological department, the ecological department, physical department, etc. And even with guys yeah, doing or teaching uh, the economical part, because all the link that we have is because we need resources in order to survive at the upper part of this beautiful planet. Okay, so let's go to the processes of the coastal change. So. We, we have uh, lost uh, may, may many uh, factors that we have to put in our mind, and sometimes it's very difficult to uh, recall or to remind all. Then I propose to you a catalog that I got from a book that I will give to Anis and uh, Najib and Thomas, uh, showing uh, what are all the forces and processes explaining the moving of the shoreline, land where or sea where. So we, we have to uh, be careful and to have always in our mind time and space. Space and time, really important. And don't say, uh, oh, silver change is more important. OK, maybe, but take time to see all the factors. So the table nine. Dot one is the first local technonism. So in my place in France, in Peninsula, Brittany Peninsula, not really. But you, yes, local technonism. So short term events can explain maybe little or subtle subsidence. So subsidence. Huh? So very important. Regional technonism, yes, of course, uh, local and regional in Java, in Semarang, uh, I think so. so. So we have to discuss with people monitoring the motions of the fault, what could be the displacement, etc. Another thing is to care about the static change. Uh, as we know that uh, the sea level fluctuations uh, will lead to direct translations or regressions of the marine environment. So, so a static change at the global uh, scale, it's really important. What could be the impact in Southeast Asia? Okay, uh, and to, to, to check about that. So lo local tectonism, regional tectonism, really important in Southeast Asia. A static change, yes, sometimes difficult to to see, but in the past, maybe to, to check where was the, uh, the higher or the lower uh, level about that. Technonism in the Inderland. Yes, again, in Java, I think it's uh, every day. Maybe you cannot feel it, but uh, uh, we can observe. And with drone survey, maybe with some monitoring, you can continue to, to have this. Uh, sensibility to say okay maybe you cannot feel it but we have observed some terrace when i was uh, last year uh, in your country we were doing some drone survey with uh, najib and we saw some terrace so so we can feel that the rivers are not really stable and it's not only about the base level or the sea level fluctuations is related as well probably with the vertical motions of the the soil or the basement Climate change every day, everywhere, and affect uh, the 
withering the erosions uh, and the transportations of sedimentary products, climate change in, in the depositional area, uh, then as well can uh, affect and uh, um, all, all the climatic change over there uh, can explain the rapid alterations of the depositional product. And as well, uh, oh, sorry, the last one, I cannot see the last one. Okay, the, all the effects of that uh, to the ecosystem, uh, even the carbonate uh, ecosystem, or uh, to, to look about the vegetation, uh, mangrove ecosystem, for example, or the forest uh, that we have in this area. What could be the response of the vegetations of the flora and the fauna in my ecosystem? Second slide about the table 91. So, to, to have a good understanding about the, the, the global tectonics, uh, where are the basin, the width, the thickness of the sediment, the compactions of the sediment. I mean all the history of the basin where we are. So where I am in Delta, it's like a small basin. So what, what happened? Why, why is it like that? Uh, to, to have a, um, um, knowledge about the geological zone where I'm working. And of course, to work with guys from oceanography department to get uh, information about the ocean currents the wave regimes, and as I was talking just previously with you to discuss about the sources and type of the sediment, uh, transportation, it could be the distance related to the tidal current, and what about the human activities that can be affect, altering as well my area. So if you summarize tectonism, a static change, climatic change. I need to know the geograph geomorphological area. I have to have at least a minimum of knowledge about currents, wave regimes, which type of sediment are in this place, or what could be the futures of this sediment, and what about human impact in the coastal zone. So we were talking about dam, uh, um, collected the sound from the rivers, etc. All these type of information are really important. So I, I was using this sketch. I didn't take time to retrace it. Uh, but uh, anyway, you know, I gave to you this one. It's quite similar, but it's not really uh, explain with the same way. Anyway, I, I can use this one from uh, John Kraft uh, that I put at the first slide. So regional climate change, more erosions, equal er regressions. So you, you have as well all the factors, climate change, tectonics. And I, I like this uh, sketch. Uh, we need to retrace it. I will do it later on. Uh, tectonic uplift, subsidence. So, we can play, as I told you, with different uh, factors and we can do different melodies uh, in order to understand where I have a lot of sediment over there, come from the mountain. Okay, if I change these factors, what could be the, the predictions? What could be the future? So I, I think this good, good summarizing, uh, it's a good summary to, to use uh, this one, you see, and I, I like it because sediment compactions is like what we have in Java. So, and in parallel with these compactions, if you have higher compactions, you can feel that the flooding can be explained because of that. And in parallel, if we have a wave change, we can affect more and more and destroy the coast. And in parallel with the climate change, if the sediment flux increase, oh, you will be happy to have more sediment. But in parallel, human impact can collect some in the rivers. 
and you have some dam. So the sedimentary budget can be affected by human impact and in parallel with normal or natural factors like compactions, like erosions from the wave processes. So you, you have all the uh, small factors in order to explain what, what, what could be the reason that I have this type of uh, shoreline or, or all the consequences that I can observe in my area, in the local place where I'm living. Uh, but again, go zoom out, zoom in in order to, to try to understand all, all the things. Okay, so you have this picture, so you can play with that as well. And I will give to Agnes the, the book for that. Uh, sea level change, uh, very important processes. Uh, because it is important because it can explain the positions of the shoreline. Uh, can explain that. Um, then can explain the positions of the shoreline and in parallel uh, can explain what is the history of the coastal zone or I can reconstruct the coastal stratigraphy sequences. So what about the causes of the sea level change? So can be related to tectonic change glacial isostasy, hydroisostasy, geodical change, sea level change resulted from altering glacial and interglacial episodes. This is from the quaternary period, but maybe uh, sometime tectonic change or isostasy uh, can be the reason that we can observe some subsidence of some highland in Pacific Ocean. Uh, independently about the sea level change. But if in parallel you have a sea level rising plus subsidence, you can uh, increase again the flooding of the place and uh, be a challenge now to know where can I go if I'm living there. So it's, it's quite, quite difficult. Anyway, uh, I, I, I have selected this uh, sea level curve, fat curves, a lot you see from different uh, authors, Fred Bridge, blah blah blah. And you see, I was using an uh, old one. I told to my colleagues, okay, could you give me the, the, the last one? So mostly we are playing with same people. I mean, even you are using sea level curve from these people or you are using sea level curve from recent paper, okay, you will see that most of them, they are using this one again, and we can use a lot from different journals. So this one starts from 20,000 years ago to today, and we can continue to reconstruct uh, this sea level curve. If you are living in nearby the Baltic Sea in Northwest Europe or uh, North Sea. The sea level curve for the recent period between 10,000 years ago to today is totally different with the sea level curve that we have in Indonesia. Because as you know, with the uh, shifting and the retreating of the ice sheet after the, the the melting, uh, we got a very huge uplift. Uh, this is the case as well in New Zealand. And the uh, sea level is lower than uh, maybe what we can observe in Indonesia or Brittany because of, of this uplift after the retreating of the ice, etc. So, local place can explain this huge uh, difference between this. Um, line here. Yeah, I'm trying to find the colors, uh, the red maybe, or the pink colors, and uh, this one is maybe green. Okay, so don't be shocked, and uh, you can play and have a average. Uh, you can see the trend, but locally can change because of the tectonics, the 
uh, glacial isostasy, etc. So some text uh, about that uh, that you will take time to read. I would like now to share with you some example uh, uh, to show in Sotestasia what was the case in the past, uh, what was the impact for the last uh, period, because we are mostly interested about the Holocene epoch and the sea level rising. Um, even we have different curves and we would like to have the best fit curves. Um, okay, maybe if you want to be a specialist of that, uh, I would say go, go ahead. For that. Um, so it's an eternal or continuity in debate. Um, but it's, it's really important to show what was in the past uh, the shoreline, what was the position of the shoreline in this case, and what was the climate. Including the knowledge about isostasy tectonism, local sediment compaction, and again and again to try to separate what what has the short, medium, and long term uh, events and factors. So, when you are looking about a longer time scale uh, between in these first uh, scales uh, at the top of this. Uh, Figure, sorry, you are in the case, or you can see sea level one, and you can see a sea level rising to sea level two. So you are uh, moving on the left, or you are in this case moving on the right. So you change the shape, not really the shape of the profile, you just observe the shifting of the sediment. And you have a point there that can be stable, but you can observe the shifting of the crest over there. And as well, you can maybe observe the increasing of the sedimentary uh, budget that we have uh, here. So this is a concept. I think it's not difficult as well to understand that. If you are using uh, information from this book that I will give you in Celo, I like this picture. Uh, you have two keys. First case, the sea level rising is rapid. Second case, very slow. When it's very rapid, you don't have time with wave process to destroy the old barrier. You have, if you have sufficient sedimentary budget, you can build the second one. Okay. Few of these barriers, few uh, particles can be reworked and removed, but it's very rapid. If it's very slow in the archive, you will not see the previous barrier. So the impact about if of the sea level change, if it's rapid or slow, is totally different on the course. So in our case, I think by today. Um, the sea level rising is very slow, so you destroy slowly and slowly the the the, the front um, from maybe ten meter depth or more, depend about the your expositions. Uh, if you are in front in, in the western part of Ireland, in Gulf of Biscay, it's huge. The energy is very high, and so you can destroy and if the sea level is rising slowly, you have to imagine all the processes to rework and to redistribute the sedimentary particles on the left, on the right, and few of them can build and participate to the building of the sandy barrier under the back of the lagoon. Okay, so you can remember rapid, slow. If it's rapid, you forget. You don't have time with the various processes to rework that. Next, I would like to share with you some uh, pictures uh, showing the silver rising, and probably you know about uh, these people from Edlik, Satya Mur Dihan, and Harold Boris. In 2006, they were publishing uh, from the Sumda shelf some map that we can uh, discuss, that we can, uh, um, that we can maybe. Uh, uh, 
try to, to see what is the importance of that. Alors, what mean the last glacial maximum? So, uh, I, the last glacial maximum, and I, I, I will try to use this link, I don't know if it's working or not, but uh, so that it was working last, last, uh, last week, then you can use it. Uh, maybe you have already used it. Uh, and so if you are not comfortable with each term nine by today, you have a lot of information online that you can use. Uh, and I will see if it's working. Maybe it's difficult. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Okay. So it's probably working. And you can use it. <laughs> and uh, okay, you have. This is in French, I will wait. But anyway, I will not uh, spend too much time about that. So you can use this link and learn by yourself and use these pictures. So I don't know what happened here. It's probably my... Okay. I would like just to show you. This is in English, it's not in French. Okay. See? Okay, then uh, let me go back. Uh, so you can use it. Uh, could you hear me again? Uh, I want to be sure, Anis. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, you can use this video because I don't know if the connection is very good and to follow it, but uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, small video online that you can use in order to perform your knowledge about uh, what was the last glacial maximum. And this is what I would like to share with you now. And uh, 20,000 years back, it's maybe sometimes difficult to imagine what was the landscape, but uh, mostly you see in the northern, uh, north hemisphere, you have a lot of uh, high shade everywhere. So, and even in the mountain, like Himalayas or in Alps, uh, and in Cordillère des Andes as well, from Patagonia to where Peru and Chile. So, and you imagine all the Antarctic high shit as well. So by today, we are mostly uh, um, uh, uh, more uh, sensitive with the melting of that because we can observe some change at the, the, the top of the, the oceans. And uh, in front of high shit, we have as well most of the sea were uh, frozen. Uh, so you see the part where the oceans was, I mean, with liquid, with water liquid. Anyway, you can at least, at least see that in the Sudoland bridges. So you can go from Sumatra uh, to go to Thailand or to go to uh, uh, Vietnam or to go to see your cousin in Borneo. So it's quite interesting to see as well that in this case, uh, not maybe so difficult to go to Australia through Papua New Guinea. Uh, so good to, to, to have that in our mind. It was yesterday, 20,000 years back. Uh, so you, you see some maps from North America, so a lot of uh, high shade as well. And uh, the thickness should be more than uh, two or three meters, sometimes four kilometers. Even in Europe. So at the top, you see UK. So it was only ice. So more of the people from UK or Ireland was living maybe over there. So it's, it's good as well to put that. And the ecosystem during this period was totally different. And now we are taking care because they say, oh, we are changing everything. But anyway, so at this scale, time, time scale, you see the change. A lot, a lot. And what about Sunda Shelf? So, okay, we can uh, say it's not uh, the best map. Anyway, I consider that from P2 
people from Edlik and uh, Voris in 2006. What they propose is quite interesting to, to see. So even they were taking care of the lake. Anyway, uh, it's not really easy to, to reconstruct that. I was trying to, to do the same thing in, in France as well. But you see Sumatra? You see Sumatra, you see, uh, you see Chavasi, and it, you was in capacity to go to Singapore, no need to take a plane or a boat, and you can go by, by, by walk. So uh, funny during this period, but it was probably a zone where the life was not so bad, not so cold, not so hot. So uh, wow. Probably uh, during this period, it was a really good, good period for people there. And the sea level is rising slowly and slowly. Sea level is rising and is flooding some place over there. Maybe some lake are created over there. So the sea from Bengal area or Adamanan, Adaman Sea are coming toward Malacca Strait. Etc. And the sea is coming by this way and slowly can come from uh, Krakatoa Strait uh, between Sumatra and Java. And uh, you, you, you see the backbone of the volcanoes slowly and slowly can be flowed as well and separate and create different islands. So the consequences of that are huge. So, and you see the flooding, the connections is not so clear between. Uh, China Sea and Java Sea, and you can see a zone where you can recognize over there Bellington Highland and Borneo, of course, Kalimantan. And you flood more and more, more and more you, you have this flooding, and you reach approximately the coastline. You can feel here that it's maybe look like the shoreline that we got by today, and uh, you have some deltas, you see over there, they are putting the deltas and you are flooding the estuary or the delta zone. And what was the, 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 the consequences of that? Now, previously, during the time between 30,000 years back to 20, you have incised valleys or inside channels, going toward the pass shoreline. And you have some, you see over there, you have some uh, sand barriers. So the sea level is going down, and after that it's going up. And when it's going up, you feel again the pass uh, inside channels. You create new one. This is a coastal plain, and slowly and slowly, this zone is completely submerged. And below, you have all the history of this last glacial period. After the flooding, you redistribute all the sediment from alluvial plain, coastal plain. You redistribute the sediment and you fill it by sediment in marine context a strain context, delta context, to reach the coast. So what about the paleo ecosystem 20,000 years back uh, in Indonesia, or in Sonda Shelf? So you see it was uh, uh, completely dominated by savanna. So probably with hippopotamus, elephant, uh, with the fauna that we have in the savanna zone. So we have dry mountain, cold mountain. So this is from a book that one of your colleagues made. I have to put the references, I forget. I just retrace the, the map with my colleagues. And you have over there the Palo Rivers. You see, it was very huge country, a large, very huge shelf with all connections and with an ecosystem, forest ecosystem totally different. Uh, that we have over there. So thank you for this part, and I will uh, maybe uh, take a few time for questions. Anis, what do you think before to go to the next one? 
Uh, okay, but right now we still don't have any questions. Uh, okay. To all the participants, if you want to ask to David directly, you can raise your hand or you Maybe can you. Yeah. write your question. Or you want to continue right now, David? Well, uh, until one time you have to continue, I don't remember. Uh, you still have 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. So I, I will continue because the next one is not so 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 big as well. And I will finish by the chapter four and we okay. will start with the questions, okay? Okay, okay. Okay. So the after co coastal stratigraphy, we just want to, to go back to Rocky Coast very rapid, which you will see because it's uh, it's not less 2D, but it's not really uh, common to everywhere. Uh, anyway, we, we, we need to know. Uh, we need to try to see about that because I consider that the sedimentary budget that we have in this case with the sea level rising or with the with higher withering, don't forget that uh, rocky coast can be a good uh, uh, sources uh, in order to increase the uh, supply sediment to the coast with borrowers, with blocks, etc. So in these photos, you have uh, photos from the Normandy coast in France. It's a short, short coast. You have the same in Brittany. Uh, and you have uh, here uh, arches so that you can observe. This is carbonate platform, Jurassic carbonate platform and uh, very uh, um, brutal, I mean, uh, with the wave processes and uh, somewhere over there you have some houses and the queue are already collapsed uh, because of the retreating uh, of the top of the coast. So Rocky Coast is around 33% of the world coastline so as you can see it's not uh, it's, it's quite a lot <laughs> or it's not a lot depends about your sensibility around that and it's related to tectonic, tectonically active coast california chile uh, and the destructions of the bedrock cliff uh, uh, unit mechanical actions with the biological erosions can do that and you, some place are we can we don't have coast, uh, rocky coast in so, certain sorry in on the southern North Sea coast for example and I just add that in north part of Java you don't have uh, rocky coast as well so it so depends on where you are living okay one more example in Australia you see and uh, you can see over there are some birds the quality of the photo is not so big nice uh, sorry so you have some cave over there so uh, when you are here you can feel as well the actions uh, of the wind we, because the salinity is higher so many factors can uh, uh, increase the withering uh, not only the water from the clouds but as well the water from the, the sea and with the high salinity you can affect more and more the sedimentary particles etc you can see as well that with the wave um, actions you can have uh, you, you see uh, a concave uh, morphology at the base of the, uh, the cliff and slowly explain the erosions of this zone. So mechanical actions by wave is the most important erosive agent uh, in, in, the, in this case. Uh, we are not talking about, you know, the, the sedimentary displacement. So wave actions can uh, provide uh, a lot of debris along the coast. Uh, and um, it's by the wave shock, the wave hammering and the compressions of air that, uh, that you explain these uh, hydrostatic pressures. Withering processes are uh, same that along uh, normal coast huh, with physical and chemical processes. Uh, so, uh, and the liturgy of 
the cost if it's more carbonate or dominated with granite or uh, magmatic uh, but plutonic uh, rocky zone is more stronger than uh, carbonate cost or uh, even mica sites. <clears throat> and uh, so something that we have to uh, don't forget, it's about the biological erosion. Okay, so next, so this is a model, uh, conceptual model from Incelo showing uh, the, the actions of the wave uh, shock and uh, that we can observe at the top of the cap here or the promontoire, promontory. So, and slowly and slowly you can destroy and uh, reach uh, this type of shape with a building of few uh, few uh, sun speed or beaches, etc. So the concentrations of wave energy to where the heat it land uh, can affect and can explain the the, the, disappear, the disappearing of the rock So it's 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 serious somewhere in France, for example. It's serious in Scotland, in Ireland as well, uh, because when you 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 lose uh, some part of the rocky zone you can use sometimes two, three, five meters, something like that. So it's, it's quite, quite uh, important. But can be uh, a source of sediment and uh, change, of course, uh, the sedimentary budget along the shoreline. So now let's see uh, after this uh, short uh, view about the rocky coast, all the geohazards, coastal vulnerabilities in northern coast of Java. We, you, you told me or you asked me a lot of questions about that. So I just want to share some slides. So again, uh, firstly, um, if I'm come from Java, uh, I, I want to see. Uh, because the waters are really important. Where are the distributions of the rainfall? And mostly you can observe there that it's related to the topography of the reef. So, and water distributions and water resources are linked. Uh, and you can see as well that the rate of rainfall is huge if you compare with my country my country it's less than 100 you it's you double so a lot of water on this area close with the volcano area where we have of course the high topography because the clouds can be blocked by the topography and uh, and we can of course, have some water along the coast as well. But need to remind sometimes where come from the rainfall uh, because we have some issue about that. What about the climate change uh, as well? If the distributions of rainfall change can affect the ecosystem, can affect as well uh, human activities. And we know that by today, with the climate change, these distributions is maybe not the same. And even you are living in a tropical area, we have to take care about this resource. Uh, we, we have to be very serious, even in Brittany, in France, you know, where I'm living, people think that uh, no issue uh, with the water. Now we say, no, you, you, you have to protect the water because we don't have enough. Many people are using a lot of water and it's a big, big, big difficulties, big questions by today. And in your country, you, you have this uh, consequences. The littoral is drawing and is flooding. So I was very, I would say shock or surprise. I never see that before. I never realized that can be a problem. And when, when Dr. Elmi was, uh, Explaining to me that uh, I say, oh my God, it's quite interesting to help and to 
to try to understand what, what could be the causes of that. So it's not only about human impact, I think. Uh, and you and we have to, to work with it. With satellite image, we can see that. So the geohazard, it's now permanent. I think it's not, uh, uh, it's permanent and you can feel and you can see from the satellite image, the maximum of the flooding and with Magalik Nock and Thomas, I know that they, they, they want to work about that with uh, Abderkader in Semarang. So it's a very good challenge to, to try to understand that and to, to see what could be the reason, all the controlling factors, and what 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 we have to do. This is, this is one of the questions that we, I can get from the, the, the students. And I, I met some person, so you know the place, so we have a big dilemma. Uh, and what we have to do with people that they don't have enough money to do, to go in and to build another house, etc. And this is everywhere the same same case. And we are building some bigger uh, zone in order to have this economy between your partners or with uh, to communicate with everybody. And uh, but this this airport, it's is very close with the sea. So maybe we have to care about that and specifically about the tsunami mit mit mitigations plan. So in conclusions, uh, in my case, what, what could be the role of the geologists is to continue to discuss about all the factors and to explain and to continue to be educated about that, to discuss about what could be the factors explaining that this zone can be very sensitive to all the factors and what could be the future of that. So we need, of course, engineering, science, social humanities, and we need to monitor, to regulate, and to be very clever to innovate in order to, to maintain, to continue, maybe to change a bit, to accept as well the change in our mind. We have to accept and maybe to have another uh, view for the future in order to still uh, live with uh, peace conditions, with more serenity and peaceful uh, area should be the best for, for human and for all the people and, uh, and our ecosystem, even if it's urban or uh, artificial. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, last uh, Chapter, I, I prefer to stop now and to open the question sessions. Okay, it's interesting, David. Uh, we have questions here in the chat box and also in YouTube. Uh, first, I will read the, the questions from Jenian. I think it's a little bit complex, the questions here. Okay, uh, with the complexity of the initial condition and physiochemical processes affected the coast, how can we determine if a change recorded from sediment or geomorphological evidence is global or local? Can we have an example? Well, uh, if you want to separate if the factors are local or global, um, you, you, you need to collect the samples from the coast, for example, the, and you can analyze with uh, chemical processes. You check, for, for example, the minerals uh, and the evolutions of the minerals and chemically uh, can, can evolve, can change. So, uh, and to separate what could be global. Global should be, uh, you know, the climate. Uh, local should be uh, uh, if you are, have some zone with uh, uh, increasing of, of uh, Increasing of the acid uh, water may be related to uh, pollution or maybe because of the climate change. Uh, if, you are, if you have two more CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, rainfall uh, should be more acid. And then you can see as well the impact uh, along the coast. But again, to, 
try to discriminate if it's global or local. Uh, you have to select a zone to monitor the zone. Uh, but of course, that the chemical processes um, will depend about uh, water uh, molecules, um, so should be local. And if, but if you monitor, enfin, if you uh, collect meteorological data uh, from, for example, 1980 to today, I will invite people to check about the change of the rate of rainfall, the change of the temperatures, what could be the trend if it's in greasing or degreasing. Uh, if it's in greasing or degreasing can be related to the global view. And locally, uh, what about the water, the water quality, and if it's affected by uh, human activities or not, or deforestation, something like that. You, you, you get the point? Yes, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, the next question is from Devina. It's about the sea level and climate change. How can it uh, relate it to the, uh, the change of the wave and how can it affect uh, the morphology of the coastal area? No. Again, uh, uh, when uh, we are thinking about uh, wave processes with the climate change, um, what, uh, this is what I'm doing in my laboratory with my colleagues. Uh, personally, I, we, we, we believe about the sea level rising because we have some tools showing from 1950 1950 to today, that the sea level is rising. Okay. The rate of this sea level rising, it's around one to three millimeters per year. Uh, but we consider that we have to check with details the frequencies and maybe the change of the wavelength and the wave height, height from the same period. And you know, this weekend in France, we are waiting for new storms. And the frequencies of the storms are, you know, uh, more, uh, we have more storms, I will say, and it's very surprising to, to have these storms again uh, by in autumn. And the velocity of the wind, it could be around 150 meters per second. Uh, no, no, 150 kilometers per year, uh, hours, sorry. So it's, 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 it's very uh, huge. And I have a feeling that we have to care about the change of the wave processes because of the climate change, not only to look about the sea level rising. I think it's not the way to try to understand what happened. Look with details what was the monsoon in maybe 1980, what is the monsoon by today? What are the differences? If I have difference or not. To care about the database, again, uh, I am a part about that, but I believe about that. To compare if the wave in the past was with the same characteristic to the present day. For the moment, I have a dot. And uh, in France, for example, in Europe, I think so. After 2010, we have a big change along the shoreline. And this big change is following more um, more and more storms with 
higher frequencies. So what could be the role of the sea level rising that is very slow by comparison with increasing of number of storms along the coast? This is what I would say. Then take care of that. And the consequences, of course, about what happened in, along my shoreline, it's more and more washover fans that I present to you, more and more flooding. And if your shoreline didn't have buffer with like mangroves, mangrove forest, bah, the flooding can be higher. And uh, when the water is still there, it's quite difficult to say, okay, please, uh, can you go back? I hope that I have answered to the question. Take care about the number of storms and to measure all the parameters, parameters of the wave or tidal current. Please check that. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Redi Stiawan. He asked, uh, based on today's climate condition and high human activity, how close we are today to the next glaciation? What natural cause that might accelerate glaciation? If we are using about uh, astronomic uh, parameter, uh, we are going to a glacial period. So mean the sea level is probably uh, uh, falling, but uh, it's not next uh, 100 years. So independently about that, uh, what, 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 what we can say, I, I will say that uh, in this climatic period that we are living, uh, we have some changes, um, maybe uh, totally different that we, will, we have never uh, recorded till today uh, because of the human impact. I'm not so sure to, to say something that can help the students for that. Uh, if you can, could, could you please repeat the questions because I, I, I'm not so sure to. Uh, Ready asked, what natural cause that might accelerate glaciation? I don't know. Mass accelerate glaciations. <laughs> This, the next uh, glaciation is at long term by comparison with what we are uh, record by today. You cannot, cannot, cannot mix, you can compare, I think, you cannot. So independently about uh, what happened by today, we are going with the astronomic, astronomic factor to a glacial period, but um, slowly as well, I would say. Then I can't predict. I'm not specific about that, so so I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, then uh, maybe Ready will ask you another question by email. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. The next question is actually from me, David. <laughs> I have several questions here. First is uh, I'm curious about mangrove. Last time you mentioned mangrove, right? Yeah. Uh, can we use mangrove to reduce the potential the potential damage of tsunami? Good questions. And is uh, a mangrove system? It's a very good buffer, as I, I told you. After yeah. that, uh, if uh, when, when I saw last time Nache the impact of the tsunami, uh, I don't know, honestly, if we have the capacity to, to limit uh, the impact of the tsunami with uh, a wave that could be uh, a wave that could be more than 20 meter high, for example. So I, I don't know. I, I okay. I want if you have. Two minutes I want to show to you something. Okay. 
because I have that which move. Oh, tak, 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 Oh, I made something about, you know, the, the tsunami in, where is this thing about tsunami, 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 tsunami. Yeah, probably there, let's see. Oh. Sorry, I will go back. Uh, I have a um, there needs <clears throat> geomorphology. Okay. So this is from satellite image in Ache in 2004. So before the tsunami just after the tsunami and after maybe uh, six months or one year something like that then an issue see the part here so mostly six six hundred or four hundred meters has been have, has been destroyed after the tsunami in a zone that is very flat you can recognize over there you know you see there you can recognize the the, the channel the channel is over there okay so i don't know this is a rocky coast in that shape so you see there after the tsunami you impact you were going toward the the, the land land where here affected the zone, and if you see this area, it was less sun sandy, now it's more sandy. Look uh, another example, see the place? So it looks like it's not mangrove system, but there it's aquaculture anyway. When I see the, 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 the force of the tsunami, I don't think so. This is what I will say. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so. But for the sea level rising and for mm -hmm. the storms, yes. Oh, okay. But at least you minimize. I will say don't 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 do that. But I, I think you minimize because if the tsunami is not with a big wave, because there it was a very strong tsunami, but a small mm -hmm. one maybe with a forest something like that, you you can decrease a bit the velocity of the wave uh, but but you see uh, it's, it's very uh, incredible okay that's why you need to use the archive mm -hmm. in the geology in order to have a better knowledge about that mm, okay oh. So, so when we're talking about storm and tsunami uh, in the context of the process, I think it's very different. But I wonder if uh, the tsunami and storm deposit, uh, can we distinguish between the two of the deposits? Yeah, Maybe yeah, have example? yeah. yeah we can. Uh, you, you can, uh, a tsunami, it's a storm, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. and most of the storm are... Uh, uh, I mean, it's a short, short, very short event. This is what I share with you during the first uh, first class. Um, if you remember, you go to the first class, you take uh, the, uh, so in deep, you take this one, and I, I gave you this slide. You see, you go to the meta scales, and you go to the micro scale, so you have all the small process. And of course, uh, in this case, the consequences that you can observe there can be affected by storms or tsunami. Uh, but after a tsunami, you cannot destroy a, a, a total deltas. 
but a storm is maybe a few hours, a tsunami it's uh, or like a storm, a few seconds, and you can destroy this part and few zones at this case. Depends about what you 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 are talking about, but uh, of course that the risk is to have big events, and big events can affect for a long time. I think uh, the 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 cost. This is the case here. This is the case. You you go back to Google Earth. I can give you these pictures, and you will see that it look like now like that, and in the past the road was there. So after now we are in 2020, it looks like, like that. So a tsunami has changed the place, and we don't know where are the sediment over there, etc. But it's a tsunami. Oh, okay, thank you, David. Um, actually. That's all the questions for today, David. Uh, we already have very great discussion today. Uh, but I will give uh, more. I will give uh, opportunity for the participants who wants to ask. We still have maybe ten minutes okay. here. Yeah. Can you? Ask? Take your time. Yeah. Uh, for all the participants, we already have the link for the material for today. You can download uh, the material and And uh, the next next class, uh, Anis, I can present. Uh, yes. The next one should be related to the second stratigraphy. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I wa I will talk about that. Okay, and maybe we will have uh, different students. Yeah, uh, you can give. I, I don't know if I already sent to you that I don't. Know. Yes. Yes, we already have. Okay. Okay. Uh, because I, I have as well, uh, but I don't know if we have enough time uh, because uh, I have prepared so many supports. I made as well uh, two. One, it's about uh, estuary. Uh, okay, and one, it's about deltas. So uh, maybe you can give to the students as well. Huh? Uh, it's uh, okay. all the, the, so it's a lot, but at least it's like a book. You can use it for the class, etc. Oh yes, okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, it was what uh, Najib asked me to do. The, mm -hmm. What he said. Okay. Next, but next next class, I will talk about uh, stratigraphy. Okay. Uh, and what we can do is after after the classes, we can uh, have a chat, quick chat, and uh, you will tell me what I, I can give to you. And I would like to show you as well because we have some minutes. Uh, this is, um, hello. Let's see. You see, for example. I have some book for you. Where are the book? Where are the book? Uh, where are the book? I will find the book because I, I think I have a book. I put the book here. Then I, I will prepare for you the book, okay? Oh, okay, okay. We'll wait for it. Okay. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're almost done here. I'd like to read the conclusion here for our last three meetings. We already finished uh, the webinar series with David about uh, coastal and marine geology. So next time we will have sequence stratigraphy with him. And after the three meetings, we know that 
we're now in a real danger of uh, geohazard in coastal area. So for us who live in the coastal area, especially in Samara, we need to pay attention to all the natural signs. So I will say thank you again to David for your time today. Thank you. You're welcome, Anis. Yes, uh, maybe uh, in the future I will have more questions. Yeah, uh, don't hesitate, Anis. Don't hesitate. Yeah, yeah. I will send you email, but maybe. Okay. And we will yeah. ask you, yeah, yeah, the feedback also. Please wait for the yeah. feedback. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Good day, David. Yeah. Bye bye. Yes. <laughs> okay. Baik. Uh, jadi buat para partisipan hari ini kita sudah sampai pada akhir sesi ya. Terima kasih atas partisipasinya. Tadi di chat saya sudah menyampaikan bahwa kita akan punya Uh, quiz kecil ya di akhir acara kemudian kami juga sudah memilih satu pertanyaan dari penanya yang uh, pertanyaannya kami anggap paling paling mewakili dari pertemuan pada hari ini selamat saya ucapkan kepada Jenian atas pertanyaannya yang sangat baik sekali nanti uh, silakan tulis nomor handphonenya nanti Anda akan kami beri reward berupa pulsa sebesar Rp50.000. Terima kasih. Kemudian kami juga masih punya, masih punya reward atau masih punya hadiah untuk para peserta atau partisipan yang hadir di sini dan yang masih bersedia untuk meluangkan waktunya sampai akhir sesi ya. Jadi saya punya saya punya beberapa pertanyaan yang nanti silakan dijawab untuk kemudian nanti akan saya berikan eh, hadiah berupa pulsa. Oke, nah sebelumnya eh, akan saya bacakan dulu hasil atau resume perkuliahan kita selama tiga pertemuan ini ya, karena ini adalah pertemuan terakhir tentang eh, tentang geologi kelautan oleh Dr. David. Jadi yang pertama adalah bahwa proses-proses yang mempengaruhi pembentukan ataupun perubahan garis pantai antara lain bisa kita e, jabarkan kurang lebih tektonisme, kemudian proses sedimentasi, dan juga e, human activity atau aktivitas manusia. Sehingga di sini ketiga proses tersebut adalah sangat penting untuk kita selalu e, perhatikan. Kemudian, Berikutnya adalah bahwa proses-proses natural tersebut juga berkaitan, sedikit banyak berkaitan dengan uh, sea level dan juga climate change yang kalau kita telusuri selama 20 ribu tahun terakhir, jadi tadi mengambil contoh ya, selama 20 ribu tahun terakhir itu telah mengalami fluktuasi yang sangat signifikan kalau kita lihat perbandingannya sampai pada hari ini. Sehingga proses geologi tersebut E, merupakan proses yang natural sehingga silakan kita berpikir apakah proses yang natural tersebut di kemudian hari akan terus berlanjut dan bagaimana efek ataupun e, akibat yang ditimbulkan oleh proses-proses tersebut baik e, berikutnya saya masih punya beberapa pertanyaan di sini untuk para partisipan yang hadir untuk ngecek aja apakah selama hampir dua jam tadi pada memperhatikan atau tidak itu ya baik eh, pertanyaan pertama dari saya nanti akan berhadiah pulsa sebanyak 25.000 pulsanya 25.000 jadi nanti ada tiga pertanyaan pertanyaan yang pertama nanti yang menjawab langsung eh, tunjuk tangan saja ya silakan tunjuk tangan kemudian saya saya panggil dan silakan menjawab Baik, pertanyaan yang pertama, tadi David menyebutkan tentang uniformitarianisme. Siapakah pencetus teori uniformitarianisme? Ayo. Uniformitarianisme. 
Gak ada yang tahu jawabannya? Siapakah pencetus uniformitarianisme? Gak ada? Wah ini... Ada? Ya, silakan Nur Graha Prima Santoso. Oh, hilang orangnya. Nur Graha Prima Santoso. Ya, silakan. Pertanyaannya tadi siapakah pencetus uniformitarianisme? James Hutton, oke, okay. betul sekali. Silakan nanti uh, Nur Gerhab, Nur Gerhab siapa tadi? Itu ketik nomor handphonenya di chat ya, nanti akan mendapatkan kiriman pulsa sebanyak Rp25.000. Baik, berikutnya saya punya pertanyaan lagi. Oke, okay. nah, saya punya pertanyaan ini masih tentang materi lagi ya. Jadi mungkin ini yang sudah mengambil mata kuliah geologi kuarter sudah tahu ini. Oke, apakah kepanjangan dari LGM? LGM, silakan. LGM. Tadi ada hubungannya dengan eh, proses glasiasi, silakan. Yang tahu kepanjangan dari LGM atau LGM. Oke, silakan Vergania. Jawabannya last glacial maximum, Mbak. Oke, betul sekali. LCM adalah last glacial maximum. Terima kasih Vergania. Silakan ketik nama eh nah, nama dan nomor HP-nya ya. Nanti akan kami kirim pulsa sebesar Rp25.000. Oke, di sini saya masih punya satu pertanyaan lagi. Nah, pertanyaan ini tadi berhubungan dengan diskusi saya dengan David tadi. Jadi, ada satu, eh, satu jenis tumbuhan yang dapat ditanam di daerah sekitar pantai yang dapat digunakan untuk mengurangi energi gelombang dari laut dan bisa mungkin digunakan untuk mengurangi efek dari badai atau bahkan mungkin tsunami. Silakan tumbuhan apakah yang dimaksud? Tumbuhan yang di Iya. Agus Nur Sidik silakan. Mangrove. Oke, ya betul sekali jawabannya adalah mangrove ya. Uh, Agus Nur Sidik, silakan mengetikkan nomor handphonenya di chat untuk kami berikan hadiah berupa pulsa sebesar Rp25.000. Baik, eh, karena waktu di sini sudah tengah empat ya, kita sudah di akhir acara. Terima kasih sekali lagi saya ucapkan kepada para mahasiswa yang bertahan sampai akhir. Jangan lupa nanti malam kita masih punya satu seri webinar lagi dengan Profesor Magali. Bagi yang sudah mendaftar, linknya diperbaharui ya. Jadi eh, cek lagi email karena kami sudah mengirim email untuk memperbaiki link yang kemarin dikirimkan oleh Panitia. Kemudian Anda juga yang ketinggalan mungkin yang belum sempat ikut acara ini bisa eh, cek hasil streaming kami di Youtube di channel Geologi Undip Official. Kemudian untuk info-info webinar series yang lain, kami masih punya mungkin lebih dari lima webinar lagi dengan pembicara-pembicara yang berbeda, termasuk di antaranya nanti ada profesor dari Jepang, ada dua profesor dari Jepang dengan tema geoteknik. Jadi tetap memantau informasi ini, Jangan lupa follow akun Instagram kami karena kami akan memberikan semua informasi langsung di uh, di akun Instagram official kami. Baik, terima kasih atas partisipasinya. Semoga materi pada hari ini dan minggu-minggu sebelumnya bermanfaat bagi mahasiswa dan menambah pengetahuan 
dan juga menambah wawasan. Terima kasih saya ucapkan juga kepada panitia dosen yang telah ikut hadir pada hari ini. Baik, selamat sore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.